what hate speech is is a verbal act of discrimination. And if we understood it more as a verbal act of discrimination rather than an expression of dislike towards somebody, it would be easier for people to differentiate between things that hurt someone's feelings or insult them or offend them on the one hand and things that harm them in a discriminatory sense on the other. Hey, everyone. I am super excited to bring you this edition of Through Conversations podcast, featuring the impressive Professor Catherine Gelber. Professor Gelber is head of the School of Political Science and International Studies and Professor of Politics and Public Policy at the University of Queensland, Australia. Her expertise is in freedom of speech and speech regulation. Her most recent book is called Free Speech in the Digital Age, where she analyzes from a range of disciplinary perspectives how the new technologies and global reach of the internet are changing the theory and practice of free speech. This conversation was much needed as we talked about an issue that has been increasingly influential in our society, hate speech. We talked about how difficult it is to define hate speech and how can we identify if something really is hate speech? What have we interpreted as freedom of speech? Hate speech and its repercussions on civil discourse. What is the chilling effect? social media and its effect on civil discourse, and much more. Regarding the chilling effect, I have to point out something that I have been thinking about a lot. Professor Gelber has found evidence that this does not happen. I decided not to define what's a chilling effect right now because I want you to listen to the conversation and get the idea by yourself. However, how can we quantify the true preferences of people if they are hiding it from the public? In other words, if the chilling effect is truly happening, I still don't see how can we find evidence that supports it. In this conversation, I try to understand in a deep manner what Professor Gelber has found regarding hate speech and speech regulation, and I find it truly amazing and important for us to understand what hate speech really is, so we can have the tools to identify it, but also acknowledge what is not hate speech. One thing for sure is that something that offends one but does not restrain any of one's rights, subordinates one, and ranks one as inferior, is not hate speech. This conversation will really help you to see clearly that there has been a disconnect in the way we communicate with ourselves, specifically regarding difficult topics. When someone hurts one's feelings, it does not necessarily mean one is being a victim of hate speech, and it has become increasingly evident that we have associated hate speech with feeling offended. After this episode, we will take a break for the holidays and we'll return on mid-January with more. I want to thank everyone who has supported this podcast by reviewing it, subscribing to it, or sharing it with a friend. It truly means a lot. I hope this conversation gives you as much as it gave me to reflect on. With you, Catherine Gelbrecht. So... Tell everyone who you are and how did you become so interested in freedom of speech? So my name is Professor Kath Gelber and I'm a Professor of Political Science at the University of Queensland. I've been interested in free speech really all of my adult life. I spent my first few years after leaving school very much as a political activist and, was, and I just always had an abiding concern with censorship. And so when I wanted to pursue further study, I decided that this would be a really interesting area to tackle. And it was also an area that there were relatively few academics in Australia working on. And so I thought I could make an important contribution. And so I moved from censorship and feminist concerns into hate speech as a kind of logical progression. Okay. And how has... Um, censorship migrated towards hate speech. Nowadays, everyone keeps talking about what is hate speech, but it seems like it's a very elastic term. It Here is. in Mexico, it feels like um, probably insulting someone or saying, maybe insulting is also an ambiguous term, both in Australia and Mexico or United States. So who is in charge of defining hate speech nowadays? Well, that's a really good question and it's very complicated, so it depends what you mean. If you're talking about a particular law, then of course it's up to the administrators and the courts, etc., in that particular jurisdiction 
to uh, interpret that law. And not all countries have criminal laws and not all countries rely predominantly on their criminal law. So when I talk about courts, I'm talking about countries that have and that use criminal law and where these cases end up in courts. But in Australia, for example, we have a system uh, with some criminal law, but also with comprehensive civil laws. And what that means is that most people, the vast majority of people who come into contact with hate speech laws do so through a civil system, which means that an individual can lodge a complaint with a human rights or anti-discrimination commission. And that organisation will investigate the complaint and attempt to mediate an outcome between the person who made the complaint and the person they're complaining against. So the interpretation of the law is really up to the jurisdiction and up to the particular authority that's tasked with interpreting it. When it comes to public debate, we do have an enormous amount of confusion and yes. different people use the word hate speech to mean a huge array of different things. And that's concerning. It's partly concerning because it means that uh, people don't really understand the phenomenon and some people claim to have been subjected to hate speech when they haven't been and people throw accusations of hate speech around without being careful about whether they're talking about hate speech or not. And one of the biggest sources of that confusion is actually the term hate speech. Yeah. So I'm actually not a fan of the term hate speech at all. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that it uses the word hatred implies that the core constituent element of hate speech is expressing hatred towards somebody. And that's actually wrong. That's wrong from the perspective of human international human rights law and it's wrong from the perspective of many domestic jurisdictions' hate speech laws. What hate speech is is a verbal act of discrimination. And if we understood it more as a verbal act of discrimination rather than an expression of dislike towards somebody, it would be easier for people to differentiate between things that hurt someone's feelings or insult them or offend them on the one hand and things that harm them in a discriminatory sense on the other. Wow, there's, I have like so many questions just for <laughs> that. I'm, so first, the, the first question that came into my mind was, so the way right now, and also what, what I've read about lessons from Australia was that the only true way to quantify hate speech has been through legislation and reports of, of those said crimes. So how can we quantify, as scientists say, um, during a public discourse or during dialogue, how can we quantify when is it actually hate speech and when is it actually just freedom of expression? So say I'm having a conversation with someone, how can we measure the dialogue there? I don't know. So uh, the, I think that there are, my work talks about there being a number of elements to that. The first one is that for it to be hate speech, it needs to happen. So government has no role in regulating people's private conversations. Um, as much as people might say horrible things in private, if it's in private, it's in private. People are entitled to express their views in private. Okay. But public discourse performs more than just the function of people expressing their views public discourse plays a very important function in democracy and governments always regulate elements of public discourse. So they regulate yeah. threats, for example. They say you can't make threats because that's just going too far. Yeah. They regulate defamation, defamation. They regulate things that are regarded to harm public discourse. So the question is, how can we quantify hate speech in a way that we're only capturing those bits of speech that harm public discourse? Exactly. Step one, it needs to be public. Step two, it needs to be directed at, an, at a target that is subjected to systemic discrimination mm -hmm. in the context in which the hate speech occurs. So minorities, primarily. Yeah. yeah. So for example, in countries like Australia, you occasionally have white people claiming they've been subjected to hate speech. And I just completely disagree with that argument because white people in a country like Australia do not suffer systemic discrimination. So they may feel offended or hurt by something that somebody says, but it's not an act of discrimination hmm. in the way that it would be if it targeted a minority that's already facing systemic discrimination in that context. So that's the second point. It needs to be a targeted at somebody who's subject to systemic discrimination. Okay. And the third point is that the discourse needs to be such that it's 
does what Ray Langton calls ranking targets as inferior, subordinating them and depriving them of powers. Mm. So that's how hate speech through discursively through the actual words is capable of harming rather than just hurting someone's feelings. It ranks them as inferior, it subordinates them and it deprives them of powers. So if all of those elements are present, then it's hate speech. Okay. Um, and what is, um, w what do you call the chilling effect? W how does that happen? And if it does happen, what's the chilling okay. effect? Okay, so the chilling effect is an argument in free speech theory that says, if you, the danger of having laws that overreach into freedom of speech is that they will stop people from discussing topics that they need to discuss openly and in a democracy. So the chilling effect is an argument usually mounted by people with a more, with a broad view that lots of free speech should be protected, potentially even hate speech should be protected, it tends to be people with libertarian views on free speech who say, yes, we realise, at least the sensible ones say, yes, we realise that some of this speech actually can potentially harm, mm -hmm. but we think the harms of regulation are greater. So we can't regulate free speech. We have to leave it to the public sphere to decide, to allow people to decide what to believe and what not to believe. And if we intervene by saying some speech isn't acceptable, people will go, oh, now I'm too scared to say mm -hmm. what I think. And if people are too scared to say what they, th that what they think about important topics, then our democracy is yeah. the weaker for it. So the chilling effect is an argument that people are chilled or, or deterred from speaking openly about their views. And have we seen that during the public discourse? Has it truly happened or is it just an argument that it's not based on evidence? Okay, so great question. So methodologically, it's really hard to establish a chilling effect, isn't it? Because wow. you're trying to prove that something has, that, that laws have stopped things from happening that otherwise would have happened. So it's very difficult to establish. There is, it depends on the jurisdiction and it depends on the nature of the chilling effect. So there is a really great report in the United States, <clears throat> excuse me, in the United States about the chilling effect of national security laws, particularly the material support laws in the United States on um, people of faith's ability to make financial contributions to their church or to their mosque. And in particular, in relation to Muslim communities in the wake of 9-11, because the giving of donation to a mosque could in some circumstances have been interpreted as providing material support to terrorism. And so there was, there was a very, there was a really great uh, report called Chilling Faith, uh, which documented a chilling effect on those communities from national security laws. So in some cases, you can say it. You can go to a community and say, did you used to do this? Do you still do it? And if you don't do it anymore, why? Mm. Um, on the other hand, uh, a broad, there's no, there's no, um, what, there, what we don't have any evidence of is a broad chilling effect in Western democracies from the existence of hate speech laws as a result of hate speech laws against people being able to talk about important areas of public policy. Quite to the contrary, in fact, we have plenty of evidence that politicians and media commentators feel just as free as they ever have, if not more free in this current global political context, mm -hmm. to say what they want to say about policy, even when they're saying things that some people might consider hate speech. For example, about asylum seekers or refugees or, um, or about the crisis in Syria or those kinds of things. So it seems to me that those who are already potentially at risk of being targeted by hate speech are themselves the ones who suffer from chilling effects when governments overreach into free speech in the name of other things, such as national security. But the, but the community as a whole, there's no sense, there's no evidence that I know of that in Western liberal democracies, mainstream political commentators find it impossible to talk about particular political topics because of hate speech laws. Hmm, that's very interesting. And the, the main problem that comes into my mind just hypothetically is, as I said before, quantifying while, well, 
you, you've already mentioned the distinction between private discourse and public discourse. And I'm having the confusion between like, let's say in a college campus, I'm talking with someone who's part of a minority. We're, yeah. in, we're in the public sphere. We're, we're in the, let's say in the outside the classroom. So yeah. the, the, maybe there's like, a, it's very difficult to quantify those times where what if I'm criticizing the religion or what if I'm just stating, well, that's another question. Why, if, if criticizing the religion of a minority is consider, considered as hate speech or like, is, is it just freedom of speech? So yeah, that's, a, that's another, another issue that comes into my mind. Yeah, okay. So it's so I think one helpful way through this dilemma is to think about what is the speech doing in that conversation. So there are ways of expressing disagreement with a religion that don't vilify the adherence of that religion and there are ways of expressing the same criticism of religion in a way that doesn't that that does vilify them. So it's not it's not the topic that's the issue. Right? It's not whether you're criticising religion or not, that determines whether you're engaged in hate speech or not. Okay. The question of whether you're engaged in hate speech when criticising someone's religion is a question of how are you doing that? What kind of speech are you using to criticise the religion? Are you ranking them as inferior? Mm, okay. Are you subordinating them and stereotyping them? Are you saying that because they belong to a particular religion, they should be deprived of powers, such as the right to vote or freedom of movement? Mm. Are you doing that? Are you, are, you, are you ranking them as inferior by saying that they are inherently inferior because they adhere to a particular religion? Or are you saying, actually, I have a political question about, you know, the use of X, Y, Z in this religion because it seems to me that perhaps, you know, that entrenches discrimination. You could say, if you said it that way, then it's not hate speech. So it's not the topic of the conversation that determines whether it's hate speech. It's, what, it's how you talk. It's the way. It's asking, yeah. so really what hate speech laws are asking people to do is to think before they speak. It's to yeah. think are they ranking people as inferior, subordinating them and depriving them as powers, or are they not? And if they're not, then it's not hate speech. Thank you. Really interesting. And... So what's the distinction between having a meaningful dialogue with someone um, that doesn't take those three criteria into account, th th those three scenarios don't happen, but doesn't migrate towards what it's being labeled or just, it's not being um, positively connotated, the idea of political correctness. So do you think, can we have a dialogue with someone that doesn't include those three criteria, but also doesn't migrate towards, um, I don't wanna try to use the concept chilling effect in a conversation, but just having like a political correctness type. Do you think political correctness is a bad thing or a good thing for starters? Do you think, are we, do we improve freedom of speech with this or do we don't? Yeah. So I think the idea of political correctness is an invention by the, by the right, by the political right, who disagree with hate speech laws and disagree with this term political correctness as a way of disparaging the idea that we should exercise responsibility when we exercise the right to freedom of speech. So freedom of speech is a human right, a fundamental core yeah. human right that, like any human right, carries with it commensurate responsibility. And the more powerful your speech is, so public figures, politicians, media commentators, the more powerful your speech is, the more responsibility you have to do no harm with mm -hmm. that speech, any more than you would do harm with any other aspect of your public conduct. So, um, so political correctness, in my view, is an invention. It's a term used by people who don't agree that they have a responsibility not to harm with their speech and who want to harm their speech. And so they throw out this accusation of political correctness as a way of trying to shout down the position of people like me who mm -hmm. say, hang on, 
I'm not saying you can't talk about asylum seekers or religion or same-sex marriage. I'm asking you to do that in a way that doesn't harm people, and they don't like that. In so a responsibly been... manner, right? Just try to articulate your ideas in a responsible manner. So Yes. Yes, that's what essentially the whole issue of hate speech is precisely about that. Asking people to exercise their freedom of speech in a responsible manner in a way that it doesn't harm others. That's, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I've never, I didn't think of the, the way you mentioned, the, the, the way you see political correctness. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've just taken it from granted by the people who, who say that it exists. So that's a good point of view. And so one question that comes into my mind is how um, can legislation truly have an effect, let's say in the United States with the first amendment in the way we communicate? How, how is that the new legislation can be created so it doesn't interfere with the first amendment, but it also creates a framework where everyone can discuss their ideas in a way that it's, um, you know, fruitful for everyone. Yeah, so in the United States, you really can't enact hate speech laws of any kind because of the First Amendment, and there have been attempts um, at uh, state level and at, uh, at city level, city ordinance level, to implement uh, some laws in the United States to restrict some of the most egregious examples of hate speech, such as cross burning, for example, and they fall foul of the First Amendment. So you can't really do it legislatively. But legislation, of course, is only one element of the strategy. And even in countries that do have legislation, we need to do much, much more to combat hate speech than just have laws. And the, the vast majority of the problem is about what we've, exactly what we've been talking about, encouraging people to exercise their right to freedom of speech responsibly in a manner that doesn't harm others. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of ways of promoting that. You can promote it through anti-discrimination campaigns. If you have a human rights authority or a human rights commission in your country, they can talk about that. You can get communities on board. You can provide target communities with resources and support so that they can create whatever they want to create, videos or pamphlets or community events that promote the idea of non-discrimination. You can do it through government speech. So governments, of course, um, have their own political points of view and governments speak that political points of, point of view all the time. So you can have leadership from government and leadership from politicians who say, let's just have a conversation in a way that doesn't hurt people. That's the way that you can get that kind of leadership. So there are lots and lots of ways. And the, but one of the advantages of having a law is that if the law works well, even some of the time, not necessarily all of the time, communities, target communities can use that as a basis for advocacy. So they can go to, they can do public events and they can go to people who are seeking to harm them and say, look, you know, there's actually, there's a, there's a line in the sand here. We've actually got a law that says you shouldn't do this and I'm not going to invoke the law, but I want you to know, I want to educate you about the fact that this is unacceptable conduct. Now, I'm not, I'm not Pollyanna. I don't think that, you know, we will, we will necessarily ever completely eradicate hate speech, but I do think that that kind of education and leadership can play a role in shifting the boundaries and in convincing some people to think about the tone and the way in which they speak. And do you think um, in, for example, the United States in college campuses, we've seen um, many colleges adopting these ideas of trigger warnings or safe spaces. Do you think that's another way of trying to create a space where everyone can dialogue meaningfully or what, what, what are your thoughts about this? So yes, I think that is an attempt to try and create a space where people can have meaningful dialogue. And I think there are, there are a couple of reasons why this has become so such a big issue in the United States. The first reason is that because they have the First Amendment, they have a kind of all or nothing system. So you can't have any laws regulating hate speech. And so people are enculturated with the idea that anything goes and in a university, which is a knowledge creation and learning environment that needs to be safe for students, 
some people, and of course we have globally now this phenomenon that people recognise that hate speech is a problem, mm -hmm. but in the United States you can't regulate against it. So campuses have somehow become the epicentre of this clash uh, between free speech on the one hand and acting responsibly on the other. And so I think that uh, that the, the whole, what's going on there is, is on the one hand a genuine attempt to try and recognise and grapple with these problems. On the other hand, because the concept of hate speech is so poorly understood, it is especially poorly understood in the United States because they've had no attempt to work this out uh, yeah. through legislation or through public policy. And so it's all got in, it gotten enmeshed, the idea of student safety, the idea of hate speech, the idea of triggering uh, bad memories in students who might have been to, for example, past sexual assault. Um, it's all gotten mixed up as though it's all part of the same thing. And so to find a way out of this kind of messiness in the United States, I would advocate that people start differentiating between the different issues that are at stake. So when it comes to students being um, warned about content that might trigger memories of a previous sexual assault, that's actually more to do with universities' pastoral care and providing appropriate medical support to students who are suffering from the aftermath of trauma, mm -hmm. right? Okay, that's really, really more about that than it is about free speech. When yeah. it comes to hate speech, sure, develop a clearer understanding of this narrow category of hate speech as I've defined it. And you can try and put that in your code of conduct. Although, of course, public universities still have to apply to the First Amendment and private universities, even though they're not bound by the First Amendment, they take a lot of they, they generally abide by it, so you've still got first amendment problems. So, so anyway, that's a complicated answer, but I think there are some mm -hmm. genuine attempts to do some good things, but it's all gotten a bit confused. Yeah, and adding to that confusion probably is the notion that uh, we don't actually understand or haven't been um, taught, my, probably my generation or generations may, maybe Older, even older generations that what's the actual idea of freedom of speech? Because we're, we, we've been in, intertwined with the idea of hate speech and trying to define it, but have we actually defined freedom of speech? What do you think? Yeah, so that's also a very good point. I think that there is a lot of people learn about freedom of speech from American television shows. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and most American television shows have a pretty shallow uh, understanding of free speech where people say oh, I've got a right to say that and there's very little dialogue and there's very little really in-depth exploration of because even in the United States of course free speech is not absolute there are plenty of limits on free speech in the United States just as there are in other countries just not limits on the on hate speech so yes I think it would be I, I guess I would go back to my previous point about uh, free speech being a right that carries with it responsibilities. Mm -hmm. you know, human, all human rights carry with them commensurate responsibilities to others with whom we have to interact in order for our democracies to work. And they carry responsibilities to the democratic, uh, to the democratic framework in which we operate as well as to other rights holders. So I think it would be really helpful for people to return to yeah. that idea. Definitely, and as you say, Freedom of speech has been the cornerstone of pretty much every democracy that has been established. And I just recently created my Quora website, which is a website where you ask or answer questions. And I asked the idea of, um, do you think that um, freedom of speech has increased or has it been more constrained as of lately? And the obvious answer to this has to, say, has to be, it has increased. The United States was created with the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights explicitly states that there's freedom of speech. The independence also says that. In the United Kingdom, you have the Bill of Rights as well. Also, example is, another example is the French Revolution and so forth. So the obvious answer to this has to say, for everyone at Quora, yes, it has increased exponentially. But I'm impressed because all of the answers that I've gotten have been counterintuitive they have said no it has decreased and it has mm. decreased exponentially so mm. for me this was, this was a very profound um learning and really interesting because we have on paper throughout all democracies the notion of freedom of speech however regular people 
people who work, people who are average Joes or people who, anyone, don't feel that freedom of speech is intrinsically in their, in their values, in the, in the way they talk. So why do you think there is, there is this asymmetry between the freedom of speech being in paper and people having intrinsically the feeling of being able to talk? That's a really great question. Certainly, if you take a historical view, you're absolutely right. At no time in history have, hum have more human beings on the planet lived in societies in which they can basically say whatever they want than now. Definitely. Uh, there are, you, there, there, there's example after example after example in history of people being imprisoned or murdered. They, and of course, this still happens in some countries in the world today. I'm saying it doesn't happen. Um, but there are countless examples of people being imprisoned or murdered or tortured or executed uh, for what they say. And there's less of that, not none of it, but there's less of that today. So I'm very interested in that, in the results of people who responded to your uh, website questions. Mm -hmm. Partly it's the self-selection, okay? So the kinds of people who respond to website questions about freedom of speech may be the kinds of people who are paying attention to this particular debate and maybe the kinds of people who um, have a particular view that they want to say things that they're being prevented from saying. So you've always got to be careful with a sort of yes. self-selected uh, group of respondents as opposed to a broad uh, representative survey. Um, why do they think like that? I think that right now in global politics, we are suffering from this really interesting contradiction. On the one hand, more politicians are talking about free speech than ever, certainly in Australia, that's the case. They're saying free speech is important. On the other hand, they're restricting it more than, they're restricting it a lot. So under the guise of national security, for example, under the guise of border control, governments are paying verbal attention to free speech while simultaneously, and, they, and when they pay verbal attention to free speech, they pay attention selectively to some particular thing or criticise hate speech. And they'll say, they'll, they'll, they'll say religion is wrong. But at the same time, behind all of that, they'll, behind a smoke screen of national security, they'll be implementing new laws that restrict it. So I think, it, I think it's a product, again, of the very big confusion that we have over the nature of political of free speech. And perhaps I, it's almost certainly exacerbated by the internet and by online communication. So online communication has absolutely boomed. The vast majority of free speech that takes place these days takes place online. Some, much of that, the online environment, there's no doubt the online environment facilitates harmful speech in ways that are broader, more harmful, more impactful uh, than they used to be. You just have to look at the Katie Hill revenge pornography case in the United States, a congresswoman who's had to resign because her, her abusive ex, she claims he was abusive, um, uploaded intimate photos of her without her consent onto the internet and has resulted, her from, resulted in her from the Congress. This kind of revenge porn is just unconscionably bad behaviour. Some of the hate speech that happens online is unconscionably bad behaviour. So, so even if you were just to look at the internet, the fact is that we have more ways of expressing ourselves than we've ever had historically as well. So we have the internet, we have social media, Ordinary people have ways of expressing themselves that they've never had before. But at the same time, we're getting such problems with that mechanism of communication that people are kind of having very emotional overreactions to things that they experience. Yeah, and what you say is very profound because everyone has the right, right now I can access my Twitter account or my Facebook account or anything and I can say whatever I can say. But one thing that it's very, um, very important to, to acknowledge is that there is this sense of anonymity, you know? So that definitely has to increase the, like my propensity of saying something harmful because I cannot see the other person who's in the other side of the screen and neither can he or she. That's very, that's very important. So I wanna, there's two questions and you can choose whichever you want to answer. So the first one would be who is in charge of defining hate speech in digital media and how has it migrated towards there? 
And the second one is how has um, freedom of speech, because you mentioned about what's happening in Australia, but every politician saying that um, freedom of speech is key to the country's well-being, but at the same time, they're creating legislation to constrain it. So I'm thinking about journalists here in Mexico. There's a lot of problems with that uh, lately, a lot of murders. And we've talked about freedom of expression all along. So what do you think about journalists in this current environment, if you choose to answer that, and if you choose to answer the digital media <laughs> question, or both? <laughs> okay, so the question of journalists is vitally important. And they're facing two problems, journalists. One is a growing propensity for people to treat journalists as political actors rather than as reporters. Wow. And that results in them being put physically at, in harm's way all over the world, all over the globe. They're at the, in the worst case scenarios, they're being murdered, but they're also being imprisoned for doing their jobs and they're also being threatened with criminal prosecution for doing their jobs. So journalists on that level are facing a very difficult position. They're also facing a difficult position because the rise of social media has put at risk the, business, the core business model which, on which investigative journalism relies. Definitely. So investigative journalism relies on permanent paid journalists who can spend weeks and weeks, if not months, running down a story yeah. and protecting their sources, giving complete confidentiality to their sources. And that has been, until recently, a core element of democratic accountability. And both of those things are at risk. So journalists are in a very difficult position, including in Australia. Um, and so there is actually a new, uh, a new uh, pro campaign in Australia for journalistic freedom. And there's a new campaign for a Media Freedom Act because we don't have a Bill of Rights in Australia, so we don't have explicit protection of journalists. And in recent months, there have been some police raid on, raids on journalists who published uh, information that the authorities believed was subject to national security confidentiality. And so there have been police raids, Australian federal police raids on journalists trying to uncover their sources. So this puts at risk the confidentiality of their sources and it puts at risk their ability to do their job without facing criminal charges. And so there's a big campaign in Australia to introduce a Media Freedom Act and all the media, the private media, the public media, the print and the online and all of the med different media organisations are collaborating. Um, you can look that up through the Alliance for Journalists Freedom. Um, if you Google the Australian Alliance for Journalists Freedom, you would get information on that. I'll so that. journalists are facing a very, very difficult time and in my view, um, they play an absolutely essential role in freedom of speech an absolutely essential role in democratic accountability and it should be a very, very significant concern to anybody that investigative journalism, public interest journalism, like public interest journalism is significantly under threat everywhere in the globe, including in what are supposedly um, strong Western liberal democracies. Mm -hmm. So that's the answer. The first question about digital media, well, that's really complicated, right? So the Digital media platforms, at this point in time, the digital media platforms themselves are responsible for mediating content. So Facebook, Twitter, etc. they have their own uh, content standards, they have their own community standards, they have these very complex policy documents which they send off to people who work in uh, call centres or in, you know, in big, essentially in There are, there's plenty of evidence that those workers are being are finding that work very difficult. They're being traumatised by having to go through horrible content constantly to decide whether it should be released or not. There's also some evidence that even though the social media companies are now accepting that they have a responsibility to do some regulation of some of the harms, they're not very good at it yet. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I'm doing a current research project with some other colleagues and with Facebook trying to improve, trying to help improve that regulatory environment. So the problem at the moment is that much of the harmful speech happens online and yet these private companies who don't have a lot of knowledge or experience or they just don't, they, 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 they want to help but they don't really know how to do it very well. Um, and so that's an ongoing conversation. 
Um, so many of those media companies are open to getting information from researchers, getting evidence from researchers, working with researchers to develop better policy. Uh, and that's an ongoing moving project. Wow. Well, two things. Um, first, with the journalists, uh, I definitely agree with what you said that their basic business model is crumbling. And well, pretty much everyone who has a blog in the internet can we now consider a journalist? Don't don't you agree? Like, and that's also very very, very problematic because journalists are truly, as you say, essential to democracies and, and essential to the spread of, of information and one question um, regarding Australia and how, how has Australia historically treated, for example, whistleblowers, if there has happened, there has been any case of whistleblowers? Yes, so, uh, so two things. The first is on whistleblowers. We do have whistleblower protection legislation in Australia. Oh, wow. So there is a recognition that whistleblowers should be protected, but in practice, when whistleblowers release information that the particularly national security related information, they can still be subjected to very serious criminal charges. And there's a case going on in Australia right now of a person called Witness K, who is a person who whistle, he was a whistleblower and he released information in the public sphere about Australia's relationship with East Timor. And he is being prosecuted by, by the federal government. Um, under that. the uh, under the act of under the argument of national security, right? Under the argument of national security, yes, yes. So there is some there's some recognition that whistleblowers should be protected, but in practice, a lot of problems with doing so. And I understand. I don't know the exact um, figures, but I understand that Australia's ranking in protection of whistleblowers and protection of journalists is dropping internationally. Wow. On the question of bloggers, so it depends on, on where and when you're defining a journalist, right? So in my view, the key distinction between a blogger and a journalist or between anybody with access to the internet and a journalist is that good investigative public interest journalism requires the journalists to exercise discretion and judgment on the material that they receive. So what they don't do is receive material from a source and then print it word for word without considering what's in the public interest and what can be kept confidential, right? So good journalists, good investigative journalists know that uh, even democratic governments have to keep some things secret and confidential, right? We all know that. Yeah. Where you draw the line on what is kept secret and confidential and what is released to the public is a matter of considerable judgment. You have to take into account democratic accountability. You have to take into account what the government's doing in our name. And you have to take into account risks of harm to identified individuals in the, in the information that's being released. And good public, public interest investigative journalists know about that and they pay attention to that before they decide what they're going to publish. Whereas the average Joe who has a blog doesn't. Mm -hmm or other people who release information in the public sphere don't. Yeah. So I know it might be a bit controversial to say that, and I still think it's difficult in a piece of legislation to define who's a journalist and who's not. And in fact, recently in the United States, the Packingham judgment recognised that, you know, the internet is the new public square and everybody's, you know, able to express themselves on the internet. But I still think there's a difference between a public interest investigative journalist exercising good judgment and being careful with what they release versus any person who releases anything that comes across their desk. Yeah, definitely. Switching gears a bit, um, what externalities are you seeing right now? Um, and do you foresee with the creation of new legislation that protects minorities? What are you seeing right now and what would you like to see? I'm sorry, I don't really understand the question. What do you mean by externalities in that context? So let's say that um, there is new legislation that protects minorities mm -hmm. against hate speech right now as a topic. And okay. do you see, like, the, the, what would be the perfect scenario in which this legislation actually goes into practice? And okay. if, is there like a, a distinction between what would you like to see and what you are, are you seeing or what would... What, are, what is your vision of happening? 
Okay. So my, my vision, I guess, is a multi-pronged approach. I do believe that you need criminal laws that, that either fine or potentially imprison people for the worst examples of hate speech, for the most egregious instances of hate speech. I do for, agree with that. For example, also, what would uh, be an example? Uh, because you, you mentioned oh, that hate speech could be punishable by prison time. Yeah. Yeah, so most of the countries in the world that have criminal hate speech laws do punish hate speech either with fines or with prison time. So that's a very mm. normal procedure. In Germany, for example, it's not unusual for members of the far right who use... It, it's a crime in Germany to use the insignia of the Nazi era. Mm. And so there are people who either use the salute or the insignia of the Third Reich um, are imprisoned. And that happens relatively routinely. In some other countries, uh, the, typically the people who end up being imprisoned for hate speech are Holocaust deniers who engage in, vir in virulent anti-Semitic uh, denial that the Holocaust had happened. And it, it, co it correlated with that accusation that this is accusations of Jewish conspiracies to make the story up. So they're the kinds of examples of the most egregious forms of hate speech that tend to result in imprisonment. And I'm fine with that. Or people who, people who engage in, um, in such bad a level of, ha of, of hate speech against any target that, that it threatens them, that it physically threatens them or that it involves violence. So I'm fine with those, with mm -hmm. criminal laws at the most egregious end. I, for the rest of it, I support a combination of a of having drawing a line in the sand, so having a civil law of some kind, but then also a, a parallel strategy of providing material educational and institutional support to target communities and to the allies of target communities to mount education campaigns and to raise awareness about the harms of hate speech. So it's not fair always to expect the target communities themselves to do this work. They're already the subject of hate speech on an ongoing basis in a cumulative way, and they may want to be involved, and of course they, if they, they should be supported to be involved, but it's also up to other people, not from the target communities, to do this work. Otherwise, you're always after the target communities to do the work. So I support a speaking back type policy where the, where the community and the governments would provide institutional material and educational support to community ventures, et cetera, that would do some of this education on the ground so that we could have these conversations on the ground about the responsibility for the public to like the freedom of speech. Wow, okay. And after all of this, what do you see? What's the, the perfect scenario, let's say, um, both in Australia and hopefully, let's, if it can get tra translated into the United States with the First Amendment, what's the perfect vision of, of all of this uh, debate between freedom of speech and head speech? I guess the perfect vision is that people come to understand that even though they have a right to say something, that doesn't mean they should. And that people should think of others and people should really begin to understand that words can do things. Words are not just an expression of opinion. Words do things in the world. And just as we should do good deeds, we should also do good words. People should ensure that the way that they choose to use their words helps us as a overcome division to work together towards common goals and let's face it we've got some pretty massive common goals that we need to get right if the human species is to survive yeah. we're going to have to get climate change right we're going to have to get inequality right we're going to have to get these things right and the only way we'll get them right is by working together not by dividing us against yeah. one another so in a perfect scenario <laughs> people would people would come to understand that their words do things in the world and they would start to want to do good with them. Yeah, and adding to that, also thinking before speaking, also th thinking before tweeting, <laughs> because yes, nowadays be nice. everyone tweets what they think and that's, that's pretty, that impresses me. And I, th another question, and that could be a subject for one 
whole other session would be why does it feel like climate change is ideological instead of scientific? So that's that's very interesting. Yeah. That's and random. Yeah. So I think this has been great. Um, where can we find? Where can the audience find your work, Catherine? Uh, so there, there is an uh, there's an outlet in Australia called the Conversation. Actually, it's a global outlet called the Conversation, but there's an Australian arm of it. So con it's called the Conversation, and it's a like a blog, public blog. And I have written several articles on that, so they're publicly available. Okay. Um, I've also written several books. I've written a book called Free Speech After 9/11. And I've written a book called Speech Matters, How to Get Free Speech Right. And I've just published a book with Susan Bryson called Free Speech in the Digital Age. Mm. So people could buy my books if they were interested. Um, I've published a lot of journal articles, but they're in the types of uh, university journals that are only accessible through libraries. They're not ex generally accessible to the public. So for the general public, the easiest things to access are my books and my articles in the conversation and other blogs great so i'll, I'll allow that in, in the bio and yeah so thank you so much for doing this it has been profoundly interesting and insightful and i hope we can continue uh, the conversation on foreseeable future and i wish you the best and we'll keep in contact and also i'll let you know when will this podcast will be up in the air and right. thanks. Please. thank you thanks so much Okay, bye. Bye-bye, take care.